Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God and Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth destruction, and the word of the Lord shall come from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for peoples, for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they burn war in war. And our New Testament reading is John 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of the light. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Cynthia. You know, there's something about a lightsaber. And someday I'm going to preach, but we're going to wait. Maybe Christmas Eve, we'll turn all the lights off, and I'll preach with a lightsaber. No, okay. The only one who said yes. See, one, I knew our kids would like that. I love the prophet Isaiah at this time of the year. This prophet writes with prophecies about what the kingdom of God will look like in its completion. The choir just sang of one of those visions, and I, I hope you were able to hear the words that they were speaking. The wolf lying down with the lamb, the leopard with the goat, the calf and the lion all together. Natural enemies now living in peace, miracles that literally only God can bring about. And our passage today is, is really no less breathtaking Except when you consider that the natural enemies are not opposing species. But the conflict is found within the same population. The population of humanity at war with one another. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The miracle of God is that here, weapons of destruction and weapons of death are transformed now into tools of creation, into tools of prosperity, into tools of life, spears into pruning hooks, swords into plowshares. That's the, the imagery of Isaiah, and it's so grand and glorious that one can't help but read this prophet during the Advent season. And then Jesus sums up the message of Isaiah. And, and I would say that he sums up his entire mission not by reclaiming Isaiah's imagery. He doesn't take Isaiah's imagery of the natural world, but Jesus does it in metaphorical terms. By simply saying this, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And we have, and are focusing on this idea of light, this metaphor of light during this Advent season. The first week of Advent, we spoke about the light meeting the presence of God. Throughout scriptures, when you read about the light, you're reading about the presence of God. And we reminded ourselves two weeks ago that in all of the major world religions, light is a metaphor for the presence of the divine. And then Jesus makes the bold claim, I am the light of the world. And I want us to focus today on the second noun in that claim, not the light. But what Jesus means when he says world, I am the light of the world. The Greek word is cosmos, a word that we are familiar with, a word found often in scripture. God so loved the world. God so loved the cosmos that he gave his only son. And while it might seem very simple to just let it go with that and trust our own interpretation of the word cosmos, you might be surprised that in the Greek, the word cosmos carries seven different meanings. Seven. Understand.
understandings of what Jesus might have meant when he said, I am the light of the world. Now you'll notice as I talk about these meetings, they move from a more general to a more specific. And I will warn you now, just in case, that I find that these seven meetings move from the most comfortable understanding of cosmos to one that is much more challenging to accept. The first meaning of the word cosmos simply means the proper arrangement or order of things. And so when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, I am the divine presence, if you will, in the order of things, in the natural order, that's a very comforting thought to us. Or at least it's a comforting thought to me that God is present and part of the natural order of things. The way that relationships of all that is are put together is because of God. And Jesus makes the claim that he is God's presence or the light in the midst of that natural order. It's a, as I said, a comfortable understanding. So we move down to the next understanding of the word cosmos. And we're starting to focus in a bit. And the second Greek understanding of the word cosmos is the adornment of the skies, the stars, the heavenly hosts. Jesus calls himself the light in the midst of all the heavenly lights. In the beauty and the vastness of space, Christ says, I am that true light. We've been, you know, I don't know, I'm blown away by some of the images that we get from space, aren't you? When we see the sunrise over the earth, when we see what it looks like from the moon, what the earth looks like from Mars, it, those pictures blow me away. And they remind me that this, this, th there's so much more than just us. And it's, it's, again, it's comforting to think that Jesus is the divine presence and the beauty and the vastness of space. And then we move in a little closer. Because we understand that our universe isn't the only one. Right? We, we do know that. We're not the only universe that exists. And so the third meaning of cosmos refers to our universe, the universe that is known. So, so this presence of God is forever moving in, not to take away from the vastness, but almost coming closer, as if this would be a good thing to think about in Advent, Christ coming closer. This third understanding of cosmos is the current universe, the world as we know it. God's presence through Christ in the world. And then let's take it one more step. The fourth understanding of cosmos is the earth. The globe, that, that which we live on. The circle of the earth. God's presence not only in the past but now with us through the church. The body of Christ. So we've continued to bring God in, to bring God closer, and these understandings are easy for us. At least they're easy for me. I, I can grasp that. And to be honest, there's not much of a challenge for me in understanding these four beginnings, if you will, of the word cosmos. But then, as we move more into the definition of the word, I start getting a little itchy. The fifth understanding of cosmos now moves in closer. And in the Greek, it refers to all inhabitants of the earth, the entirety of the human family, and beyond that, the wider breadth of all living creatures. When God makes his claim through Christ, I am the light of the world, Christ is saying, I am the light of all people and of all living creatures. Now, it might be mildly challenging to some of us who want to limit Christ's influence. I've heard folks say only to people and, and disregard the animals and creatures of the earth. But isn't it interesting that Isaiah chooses the creatures of the earth to talk about what the kingdom of God will look like the wolf and the lamb, the lion and the calf, the leopard and the goat, all under the lordship of Christ. And Isaiah is so instructive 
in this moment. Now, if you think you're getting off the hook, we go to number six. The sixth meaning of the word cosmos. The word means specifically to refer to those who are part of the ungodly multitude. Those who are part of the human race who are alienated from God and maybe even hostile to the cause of Christ. And Jesus stands and makes the bold claim, I am the light of the world. I am the presence of God with those who deny God. I am the presence of God to those who live in darkness, even by their own choice, who are alienated and far from God, who, who are hostile to the purposes of God. And I love that Jesus makes this bold claim. The primary identity of Christ, the primary mission of of Christ. We read this in scripture is to save the lost. It is nowhere in scripture do I find the words that Jesus came to keep those close to God comfortable or isolated from the rest of the world, but rather Christ's mission is to enlarge the body of those who claim Christ as Lord. And if that's the primary identity of Christ, then it must become the primary mission of the church as well. And that is challenging for many of us. Because if we were completely honest with ourselves, and I found myself here this week squirming, the truth is we want a white Christ, a sanitized Christ, a Christ for the citizens of a particular country and no others. A Christ for the rich. A Republican Christ. A Socialist Christ. Now, in case you think I'm making this up, all of these titles come from scholarly articles that I've read this week. Making the claim for a Republican Christ. Making the claim for a Socialist Christ. Making a claim for a Republican, I'm sorry, a, a, an American Christ, a white Christ, whatever it might be, there are folks out there who truly believe Christ serves a particular unit of humanity. And if we are going to understand the word cosmos in its fullest and accept it in its fullest, we would say that Christ is first and foremost the light for those who are living in darkness, who are far from God. And if Christ is that light, then we too must be that light. And our number one mission must be not internal but external to those who are lost. And then finally, this is the real, this is where I almost closed the dictionary. Where I almost believe that the dictionary must be wrong. And I'm going to quote directly from probably the most used Greek Biblical Dictionary. The Greek understood the word cosmos as referring to the whole system of world affairs or politics. The aggregate of world good, meaning economics, and the privileges and advantage of the world, meaning our justice. Christ makes the claim that he is the light to the world's politics to the world's economic, to the world's justice, and that he is the Lord and, and the light in those places as well. Now, the real discomfort comes when we only understand politics in our Western understanding, right? But, but what Jesus is saying is that he's saying, I'm here to shed light and to inform relationships between people whether they be nations or individual, whether those relations be in terms of governance, who holds the power and who doesn't hold the power, or who holds the, the, the resources. And, and there's much that Jesus can teach us about these things. And, and, and quite frankly, this is the scandal of Christ. This, this is, folks, this is what got Jesus killed. 
is that he stood against the politics of the world and the economics of the world and suggested that all should receive payment, whether they showed up to work the first hour of the day or the last hour of the day. All were paid equally, and the world couldn't handle that. This sweet baby in the manger, this sweet little child with rosy cheeks wants divine control of our politics and our economics and our justice system. And this is the world that we're often unwilling to give to the Lordship of Christ. This is the part where we squirm the most and say, certainly not that. But Jesus is bold to stand and say, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the cosmos in its fullest understanding. I am the divine presence of God in all places, to all people, in all manner of discussions. And this word, which I didn't realize had seven different meanings, causes us to ask as we read this, this text that we see so often, we, we splash it across Christmas cards, I am the light of the world. We put it on t-shirts and on our social media pages. And I wonder, do we ever really ask ourselves, which world? Which world is Jesus referring to? To which of these multiple meanings is Christ laying claim? And I think the answer, challenging though it may be, and if we really have ears to hear, I think the answer is simply this, yes. All of them. allow ourselves to be challenged by this word of God. Amen.